How do ideas transform themselves into realities? An interesting concept. Perhaps thoughtfulness, a bookmark laid in the consciousness, establishes a connection to the real. Maybe it's luck, along with the dizzying volume of ideas we contemplate. I receive questions regularly about my method for CNC milling necks. Consequently, I'm thinking about how to explain my method comprehensively. I'm faced with making three guitar necks. So I let this thinking become a reality as a video that I can only hope answers these questions. They each differ a little bit, but they're principally similar in style, if not dimension. The tone wood, inlay, and headstock shape differ, while the fundamental elements of the neck and heel shape are alike. I usually like to start with something simple and build on this foundation. Unfortunately, the first problem to solve is one of the most contentious, which is grain orientation. I take a very simplistic view on this controversial topic. If you enjoy confusion, by all means, go out and comb through the mountains of threads and forum posts on this topic. I won't be taking any sides. Tone is far too personal a topic to discuss. We all have our preferences. As far as I know, there's no silver bullet. So let's leave that one by the wayside. Likewise, I could go on and on about the precision required for the fretboard. I think we can save that for another day. This element of the instrument is at its core structural. So let's begin there. You will hear the preference for neck stock is quarter sun. Quarter sun lumber makes for fantastically stable necks. There is, however, a drawback. If you look closely at figured maple, it becomes apparent. We diminish the beauty within this lumber when quarter sawn. I'd like to explain how these differences affect the structural function. I will leave the decision making to you. Armed with the facts, it will be much easier to make even bigger mistakes. At least that's my experience. So what is grain and how does it affect the stock? It's important to remember that wood in its simplest description is a series of tubes used to move water and nutrients. These tubes grow at different rates and in different sizes dependent on the season. Seasonal growth patterns form the grain and are at their essence size variation of these tubes. I like to think about it logically. Tight-knit grains will contain tiny amounts of air and moisture. The opposite is also true. How do these variances affect the medium? Simply put, voids filled with air and moisture expand and contract laterally across the grain structure. Bigger voids make for bigger movements. This knowledge makes it relatively simple to look at the lumber and decide how this expansion and contraction will affect your stock. For the flat sawn stock I'm working with, the boards will cup or bow with seasonal changes. It's good to think about this movement while making these pieces, although in the finished part, there should be very limited movement seasonally. There is one other factor to consider, internal stress. Maple, the preferred lumber for necks of this type, is prone to internal stress. When cut, it can move significantly. This process becomes less pronounced when the lumber is well dried or aged. My process is simple. I purchase dry stock and cut in the orientation that looks the best. Now that we have broached this difficult subject that will no doubt bring a hailstorm of critique, let's move on to how I cut these parts. I have put a lot of thought into this method. Like many of you, I have devised many theories about this task. I've made several realizations, tempered with my experience. Many of my early notions were far more complex than necessary. I'm not trying to say this is the definitive approach. It's worked well for me. I encourage you to try all the methods you see and hear about and decide for yourself. I get these questions frequently. How do you match the parts when milling from two sides? Or, I seem to be off by a millimeter or two when I flip my parts. I feel your pain. 
I spent a lot of time trying to figure out this problem. I will do my best to explain it. I start by thickness sanding the stock with a drum sander to the dimension specified in the Fusion 360 cam setup. Then run one edge through the joiner. Now I have three reliable surfaces. Then I attach a sacrificial piece of MDF to the spoil board and use the Mach 3 wizard to mill the face that will define my Y axis and is parallel to the X axis. Use this milled face and the joined face to align the workpiece. I index the y-axis from this edge and the x-axis from the end grain face. Index the z-axis from the spoil board and then using MDI in Mach 3, I move the z-axis up to the thickness of the lumber and then re-zero again. This indexes all three axes to the same origin as the Fusion 360 setup. The enormous secret to two-sided milling is simple. Avoid contacting the same point from two sides. This makes any error nearly impossible to see. Human senses can recognize incredibly subtle differences. While we lack the precision to define these dimensions, we possess the capability to discern them in great detail. It's more often than not that the woodworker must attempt to fool the eye of not only themselves, but also the recipient of the work. When I flip the part, I re-index the origin in the same way. This location is different on the machine, but to the part, it's only the thickness of the stock away. I've also chosen my order of operations in a way that disguises any unintended error. I cut the truss rod slot first, then the headstock thickness and contour, followed by the boring operation. Then flip the stock and re-index from the same surfaces, matching the second Fusion 360 setup origin. This is a simple point, but it makes a massive difference. If you indicate from the same point or as close as possible, it reduces your margin of error to your ability to mount the part on access. Since we have milled a sacrificial piece to control this, we can limit the error considerably. I am careful to support the overhanging material. If it's free to vibrate, it can catastrophically destroy your part. I have unfortunately learned this lesson the hard way. I can now mill the outline first with a roughing operation with 60,000 stock to leave, and finally two quarter inch depth passes at 30 thousandths each to the final dimension. This strategy works well for me. Feel free to live and learn while creating your own outline finishing strategy. I can then run the last two operations roughing out the neck contours, and finally finishing with the scallop toolpath. There's still a bunch of work by hand to enjoy once I've glued on the fretboard. The milled surfaces make for accurate reference points. Making necks is one of the most intimidating aspects of this work. I enjoy this process, even though it can be quite stressful. I hope to help you enjoy it as well. I produce this video differently. I hope the style I've developed still shows through. I've been working on some interesting additions to my neck making process, and I hope to reveal them soon. Every comment, subscription, and thumbs up count, so I thank you all for helping to grow the channel. I hope you will all be back for the next one. 
Thanks for watching.